It's uh, Wednesday, April 28th, and I'm Toby Herzog, and I'm, we're sitting at Lane Place, and this is Mike Fry. Mike Fry is a Vietnam veteran and a Montgomery County resident, and we're going to talk with Mike about his experiences uh, growing up and high school, and particularly the military, his experiences in Vietnam and some of the events that took place in his life after he returned from the war. So let's get started, Mike. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Crawfordville from the age four on. Before that, I lived in Indianapolis. I was born in Indianapolis and was in Indianapolis where my parents lived uh, until I turned four. And then we came to Crawfordville, and that's where I born and raised, been here all my life except for the three years in the service. Okay. Why did your family come to Crawfordville? Uh, the work opportunity. For okay. My dad had a job here. Where did your dad work? Well, let's see. When, when he first come here, he was working construction. Mm -hmm. And they'd moved, his firm moved out of Indianapolis to Lafayette, and they were, they were doing all kinds of construction around here. And, in uh, uh, 53, 54, right. when we moved. Brothers, sisters? I have uh, a rather large family. My dad was married prior to marrying my mom. He had three, three children. Uh, I've got uh, two sisters that are still alive. I have a half-brother that has passed on, and then Mom and Dad got a divorce when I was 16, and Mom remarried, and she had one, two, three, three more mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So I have sisters and a brother on the other side, too. There were a total of nine children in the family. Okay. Um, any military people in your family other than you? Oh, yes. Uh, my dad uh, was a... Uh, World War II veteran. He was uh, received Purple Heart. He was shot by a sniper in Germany. He recouped, recovered from his wounds. He was actually on a transport heading for the Far East mm -hmm. when the war ended. Right. And my father-in-law was a uh, World War II veteran. He was at Pearl Harbor when it was hit. Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, did your father tell you any war stories? Did he talk about his no, experiences? No, he. I didn't find out that he was even wounded. I always saw a scar on his back, mm -hmm. where the, I mean, the bullet left a scar about that deep and about that long, where it entered in over his shoulder. And I asked one time, and he he didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that he he talked about. I finally found out. After he passed on, just what I didn't even know he was a Purple Heart recipient until after he had died, hmm. which mean, which means uh, I'd already been working, and I didn't get to take advantage of his GI benefits right. to send me to school. Right. right, right, Can you speculate on why he might not have talked about this? Any reason at all? Well, from talking with my sister, my older sister. And mom, when she was alive, it was a fact that he saw a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that it just, it was something he wanted to repress. Right. He didn't want to talk about it. Uh, he was in quite a bit of heavy fighting and, you know, he, like I say, he got shot by a oh. sniper. Right. So it, uh, it was something he wanted to repress. He didn't want to bring it, bring it out. Uh, I don't think he was ashamed of what he did or anything like that. I think it was just a matter of the experience was so negative in his sense that he just didn't want to talk right. about it. Has your father-in-law talked to any about Pearl Harbor? Yes, in fact, he was interviewed. He's got an interview. In fact, we've got a tape of him interviewed, uh, him and two or three others from the county mm. that were at Pearl Harbor. Mm. Okay, good. What was your boyhood like growing up in Crawfordsville? I think probably pretty normal as to, uh, I uh, attended school at Wilson when it was the castle. 
I stayed there from kindergarten through halfway through the fifth year, fifth grade year, and then I moved to Hose. Then I went to uh, the high school as a seventh grader, and then to Tuttle. We were the first eighth grade in at Tuttle when the new school started, mm -hmm. was built. And really it was, uh, I spent my summers swimming and fishing, and I don't really like to fish, but I did it anyway. Uh, when I was old enough, I bailed hay, uh, delivered newspapers, mowed yards, shoveled snow, just just the normal everything, everyday thing that a uh, a young guy would do. Right. What year did you enter high school? Let's see, 1962. Okay, entered high school 62, graduated in 66. Was Vietnam talked about at all in any of your high school classes, or did you know anything about Vietnam? Just what I just what I'd read in the paper. Yeah, uh, I knew where it was, but no, it was not talked about in the high school. Uh, at that time, in fact, I don't think you made front page news right. most of the time. Right. It Thanks. was second, third pages back, you know. Right, and uh, so I didn't think I didn't think a thing about it. Until I graduated. So what did you think when you, gra you had to make a decision at that point, go to work? Were you thinking about going into the military at that point? Well, I really, I really had, my mind was set on becoming a history teacher mm -hmm. and a football coach. And I thought, well, I'll go to work for a year, get my first year, and go from there. Right. And uh, I met my wife to be the day we had orientation at work, and a year later we were married, and 15 days later I was in the service. Now, you, you went to work at R.R. Donnelly? I had R.R. Donnelly, yes. Right. And what did you do that first year at R.R. Donnelly? Uh, started in the World Book Press Room, and inside of six months I was uh, made an apprentice role tender. I spent six months on my apprenticeship, and the, uh, my supervisor, or foreman at the time, was Newt Fuller, who was the draft board chairman in 1966. And he came to me and says, uh, Mike, your number's coming. So that's when I had to make my choice. That was in uh, 67. So you married, have to make a choice whether to just get drafted or enlist, right. and you decided to enlist. Right. Uh, my main reason for that was I couldn't see myself in the jungle. And I'd read enough about and seen enough about uh, Vietnam on TV and in the newspapers to know that uh, I'm not a pacifist by any means, but I'd rather talk than fight. Right. And I just couldn't see myself doing that. So I thought, well, I'll join. I'll get a chance, maybe get some education, come back out of there, out of the service, and be a leg up on, you know, the people that didn't go. So you enlisted in the Army. Did they make some promises to you? What did oh, yes. you enlist as? I enlisted as an engineer. Okay. And okay. what was an engineer going to do? Well, they gave me one or two choices. Uh, one was to go into the printing mm. business for Uncle okay. Sam okay. in the Army, and the other one was to become a draftsman. Mm -hmm. Actually draw the blueprints up for building buildings. You know? Right. And uh, Sounded reasonable. Oh yeah, it was really, really, sounded really <laughs> good, really good. But you can, uh, I was very surprised when the, the MOS, Military Occupation, come out in basic training, and mine said 51 Papa. And 51 Papa is? Crash and Rescue. Okay, <laughs> we're, we're gonna go back a little bit. Okay, say, okay so you enlist, um, you take your oath, and where was the first place that you went? Uh, first place, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Okay, and you're gonna do basic training at Fort uh, Campbell. did basic training at home of the 101st Air Force. What do you remember about basic training? Uh, very first thing, very first military person that I met 
was a sergeant by the name of Johnson. And all he was, he was a zero-week sergeant. He wasn't a DI. He was more or less a glorified babysitter. Mm -hmm. First words that ever came out of his mouth, the first words they ever said to me as, as being in the military is, hey, fat boy, move it. <laughs> I weighed 192 pounds, and I was probably, you know, right. a little overweight at that. But uh, And from there on, <laughs> it was... <laughs> it went downhill. <laughs> but uh, basic training taught me uh, that military service is hurry up and wait. Okay. You get there in a hurry, and you wait until you get served. What time of year were you at Fort Campbell for basic? Uh, I joined the service uh, the 30th of June, so I had basic training in July and August. So it was hot. It was very hot, very hot. Um, make any good friends in basic training? Yes, I did. Uh, my basic training company, out of the four platoons, three of them, and I guess our platoon, I'm trying to think now, was close to 40 eight people in the platoon, mm -hmm. close to 200 in the company. Uh, three of the platoons were NGs, National Guard. Mm -hmm. They were serving their basic training. There was only about 40 of us that were regular Army. Right. And uh, I made some good friends with, with uh, NGs from uh, Kansas and Iowa and uh, New York. And let's see. I joined on the buddy system, so my best friend was there. Mm. Yeah, but that was the last time we saw each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, basic training was eight weeks, is that right? Eight weeks long. Eight yes. weeks long. Right. Okay, so you graduate, and, and that last day of basic training, they read off MOSs right. and where you're going. Right. And, and they said crash and rescue. Right. And you were about ready to call the I'm enlistment ready. guy, right? <laughs> right. I'll I wanted to get a hold of my <laughs> recruiter. <laughs> and you said, there's got to be a mistake. Right. Here. I, went, I went and asked. I said, this is not what I signed up for. You find my papers. And, and the then, response was? Uh, you go there and we'll take care of it. <laughs> okay. That was, that was your next mistake, <laughs> yes. right? Okay. Yes. So did you have a leave after basic or did you go right to AIT? I went straight to AIT. And where was that? And that was at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And that's where the helicopter pilots are trained right. and everything like that. Right. So you're at Fort Rucker with all these helicopters. What was, it, what was AIT like for a crash and rescue guy? Well, it was completely, it's, it's something I'd never, never even, most kids grow up and say, well, I want to be a fireman. Or, I didn't want to be no fireman. You get burnt playing with fire. Right. And that's what it was. Uh, my very first... Lesson, of course, we had a lot of classroom lessons. We read, we read books and we did some <coughs> work and watched some videos and things like that, films on what was going to happen. Then our right. very first one, I remember going out in, to the woods there at Fort Rucker, and they had a pit with a bird dog, which is a single-engine piper cub. Or so everybody would understand type plane and they poured fuel in it and they set it on fire and I watched this person in a set of silvers walk into the fire and bring out a dummy and I'm saying <laughs> the dummy walked in and brought out a dummy is what he's done All right. but uh, that's, that was my first and I found out how to do that safely you know, there's always a, a, a chance that you're going to get hurt or something right. like that, but they gave me the best instruction that they could. So, so the concept behind this MOS is that you're stationed at, at different airports, air bases, right. and if a plane crashes landing right. or taking off, you guys go in and rescue. Right, right. That was so the whole so idea that's the whole it. concept. Right. right. Um, now, as you're going through this, are you still thinking, well, they'll probably put me at this big airport in the States or over in Germany? Were you thinking at all I might end up in Vietnam? Well, at that time, no. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking a thing about going to Vietnam because I'd talked to some of the uh, training personnel right. and said, 
we're needing replacements here. We've got a lot of people getting out of the service, and we need people permanent party that can become trainers. Right. And I said, well, hey, that sounds good. So I'm thinking, well, this is not what I signed up for, but if I can stay here and be, be a trainer, all the better. Uh, got ready to graduate to uh, AIT. I made permanent party at Fort Rucker, Alabama. So I'm thinking, I got it made. Half my AIT class went to Germany. Half of us stayed there at Fort Rucker. Okay. Um, 12 weeks, was AIT 12 weeks? Yes. Okay, yes, 12 weeks. So you're feeling good about the training. Were there, I mean, helicopter pilots had one of the highest casualty rates in Vietnam. Were there some Vietnam veterans who were back at Rucker? Um, there were the trainers, some of the uh, copter trainers right. were uh, Vietnam vets. Did they tell stories? Oh, all? yeah, they told, they told stories that uh, if you got past the first 30 days, you probably were going to make it to the last 30 days. But the first 30 days is when you're going to mess up and do something that you were not supposed to be doing. You fly too low or you, you don't check something behind you or, you know, right. somehow you've made a mistake. Right. And I said that uh, uh, the, only, the only person that had a worse longevity span in Vietnam than a helicopter pilot was a door gunner. Mm. And he only had, lasted maybe three days right. on the average. And, and why the last 30 days? What, what was probably... Because you're in a state of euphoria that, well, I've made it so far, you know, right. nothing's going to bother me. So now. you relax and Right, you relax and you, you let your guard down. Okay. Okay, so you're at Fort Rucker Permanent Party. At that point, did your wife come down? To yes, uh, my wife did come down. We lived in uh, Daleville which was just outside the post mm -hmm. in a trailer park. And we made friends with uh, two helicopter pilots. One on, lived on each side of me. Uh, one of them was named Turnip Seed. Mm. And the other one, oh man, he was a Mormon and I can't, I can't right. recall his name, right. but I do remember the guy named Turnip Seed because that was such a strange name. And he had an Italian wife. Hmm. She was from New York. So life was pretty good. This is more like a regular job. Oh, yeah. You yeah. have your wife there. Yeah, my and... wife there. I, I go, go in. Of course, you know, I work from 6 to 6, right. and, but I'm off in the evenings. I go home, have dinner, you know. Uh, How long did this last? Well, let's see. I was in basic training, so I'm trying to add up five right. months after I joined. I stay there until the following uh, first of June. Okay. I had, in May, I had got my orders for Vietnam. Okay. May how, of the next year. How did you hear about getting orders for Vietnam? Did you just showed up at work one day and the orders were there, or um, you uh, always have a morning. Uh, what would assembly assembly there you right. go a morning assembly and uh, one morning they called off about a dozen names says you've got orders you've got a 30-day leave and then so how did you break this news to your wife well she had a feeling it was coming I don't mm -hmm. she she actually felt that I was going before I even mm -hmm. got my orders right yeah, and I think it was just from talking to the other ladies right. in the in the park. But when I told her, she she was unhappy, and she called her mom and dad right away. And uh, about a week later, she come to me and says, "Dad says that if you want to go to Canada, really? he'll support you." Really? And, and this is the guy who survived Pearl Harbor, right? He didn't believe in the Vietnam War. Because, give me a year, this is 1967, right? 67, 60, well, yeah, it's first to 68 now. First to yeah. 68. 68. So, so protests in the United States are heating up, right. the war is becoming unpopular. Very unpopular. So your father-in-law says, right. take a hike to Canada and you're, it's okay with me. Yeah. And so did you think about that? Did that thought cross well, your mind? Well, briefly. Uh, but 
I talked to him personally about it because I was surprised. I right. was I was really shocked that he would say something right. like that, you know. And I knew the man wasn't a coward, right? You know, so I knew that wasn't the thing about it. And we sat and we talked, and he says, "I know how you feel." He says, "But I don't want my daughter to be a widow." Mm. Just pure and simple. That's right. just the way he said it. Right. And I says, "Yeah, but if I don't go." I'll never be able to look myself in the face right. in the mirror again. And he says, do you believe in what's happening? And I says, my country has told me that's where I belong. I joined on my own accord. So yes, if that's what they're saying I'm supposed to go, that's where I'm supposed to go. And he said, okay. And, and after that, he, uh, well, I guess it was somewhere about midway through my term in Vietnam, I got a letter from him and, uh, is one of the best letters I've ever ever received because, uh, uh, like all dads, they're in the guy good enough for the daughters. So. Right. But he made me feel like one of the family at that point. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so you have a thirty-day leave. Did you come back to Profitsville for yes, those did. thirty days? Yes, I did. Okay, and so that was probably a tough period of time. It right? was. It was. Um, I told my mom and her mom and all my brothers and sisters, and uh, they didn't know what to say, you know, except, well, there's nothing gonna happen to you, you know, you'll be back, you'll be back. I said, well, that's what I plan on, yes. And uh, the closer it got to time to go, the more it started to bother me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was starting to get the uh, upset stomach from thinking about it, and nerves, you know, were starting to get to me. I think one of the things that will make the most nervous, it was my first airplane flight. Uh, Never been in a jet before. Mm -hmm. Got in a jet plane in Indianapolis and flew to Washington State. So you then you went out of Fort Lewis? Fort Lewis. Fort Washington. Lewis, Washington. Right. Okay. So you, you leave Fort Lewis, Washington. It's 1968, January. No, it's actually it's June. June. Right, June. June 1968, June, right. you leave Fort Lewis. Where did you arrive in country at? Cameron Bay. Flew into Cameron. First impression, landing in Cameron. We get off the plane about two o'clock in the morning, their time, pitch black, and the heat hmm. and the smell hit you, and people started throwing up. What was the smell? What smell? I would say, how can I put an outhouse? <laughs> okay a garbage disposal that's not been cleaned for a long time and burning, you know what? Right. Uh, and even, even there was a, a strange, strange smell I couldn't even identify. Plus mixed in with all the, the, the airplane fuel right, and all that and everything. Stuff. I mean, when you walked off, I got out of that airplane, it was 70, five degrees right. in the aircraft. It's 105 at two o'clock in the morning in Cameron Bay. The, it's like walking out of air conditioning into an oven right. with all that smell. And I mean, people just got violently ill. Right. And you know, once one person starts, they say, I'm only 20 years old now. Right. right? You know, so, so it, my first impression was, Boy, oh boy. <laughs> now, was this plane also taking guys back to the, to no. the States? So you, no, you it didn't was go down and off. You didn't go through a line of people uh -huh. who were waiting no. to get on the plane? No. We got on uh, buses, mm -hmm. and they brought us into oh, a, a reception, great reception area. area. And I guess we were there for about four hours before they gave us a place to go bunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I am, I'm in a place that's a war zone. I have no weapon. I have no steel pot. I have no bullets, nothing. And I have no idea if that little guy, because that's the first time I right. saw Vietnamese, was good, bad, or right. indifferent. Right. Did you know any people on the plane on the way over? No. No. And the thing, that there's a, a little sideline there. I saw two soldiers be put on the plane with in shackles, mm. handcuffed. Really? And leg shackles. Yes, really. 
<laughs> so they were reluctant. Uh... Really reluctant to go. They didn't want any part of it. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And well, that, you know, I'm thinking now, wait a minute. <laughs> if you really don't want to go, then what good are you going to be when exactly. you get there? Exactly. You know, okay. if, that, if the person's willing to, to run away, then he's, he's not wanting to be there. I don't care, you know. Let him serve his time in jail right. or something. Right. Don't send him over there and get somebody else killed. Exactly. And that was my whole idea. You know, if he's going... God didn't make him walk on the plane, you know. He didn't make him say, you know, he could have said, I'm just, I'm a conscientious objector. I'll serve my time in jail. Right. You know, whatever. So, but don't put him over there and have a chance of him hurting somebody else or getting himself hurt. So how long were you at Cameron Bay before you got sent <clears> to your... Ultimate I was in I was in country uh, 18 days, but I didn't spend it all at Cameron. Okay. I went from Cameron down to Long Bend, and Long Bend's where I got my uh, station for Vietnam. Where do you remember anything about Long Bend? Except that there was fire hydrants and sidewalks. Right, because I was at Long Bend about yeah. that time. And uh, the building I went into was like a four or five story brick building. Right. Had an elevator. Right. It was air conditioned. Up I on a hill? That, yeah. That was yeah. the headquarters you used to be that you that, went yes. into. Yes. And that's where you got your orders. That's where I got my orders. And actually, I went into this and they said, well, what do you do? And I told them, I says, do you know how to drive a truck? I says, well, yeah, I've been trained to drive right. fire engines. Oh, well, we don't need any fire in, firefighters. We need truck drivers. And I said, truck drivers? I'd, what for? Convoys. Where? DMZ. No. <laughs> no. That's the, that's the first good no you've, you've said to yes. the military. Yes. Right? I said, no. No. That's not, I'm not trained for that. Don't want any part of it. And they said, okay. And they started fumbling through some stuff. And they said, well, we had a, a soldier hurt in this detachment in An K. I said, where's An K? And they showed me on the map. And Vietnam is shaped like this. The, the 40, let's see, is it 40? Yeah, 40 mile stretch. Starting at Quinh Yon, goes to Pai Ku, which is on the Cambodian border. Quinh Yon's on the ocean. I sat right in the middle. That's where An K was. And I says, what am I going to do there? He's, we don't know for sure, but they're, they do need a replacement there in the 52nd Engineer Detachment. I know they, he says, I know they have something to do with crash and rescue and or firefighting. Right. I said, okay. So you got in a helicopter? No, I got in an old C-47. Okay. Air Force tech hands me a parachute and says, put it on, soldier. And I said, no, sir. So, so did you go over to Benoit? Yes. Okay. Went to Benoit. I said, uh, no, Sergeant, if this plane can get me up, it'll put me back down. I'm not jumping. <laughs> and he says, you've got to, and I said, no, I'll sit on it. He said, okay. He wasn't going to argue with me. He had right. a lot more people. So you arrive at Anke. Right. And so uh, the date now is? To... Uh, let's see. We're looking at uh, July, first part of August. Okay, August 1968, Anke. Right. What happens when you arrive? Well, they put me down on this. I'm looking out the plane. I'm the countryside now. You've got uh, red uh, clay uh, shingle type uh, roofs, mm -hmm. lush green, you know. So from the air, it's looking pretty nice. Right. Not looking bad at all. We've come up and I, I keep looking for the airstrip. And there's a bunch of steel put down on the dirt. That's where the C-47 lands. He lands, taxes the other end. The sergeant tells me to get up and grab my duffel bag. They lower the thing down. I walk off and the plane's gone. I'm standing up as far away from anything out here in the middle of, still, no weapon, no steel pot, no flak vest, no nothing. Here I am, I've got a duffel bag. And I'm looking around and about, looked like to be Six, seven hundred, eight hundred yards. There was a uh, building over there, so I started walking towards there. Got there, and it was the firehouse. 
I reported to the uh, NCO in charge there, and he says, I don't need you. Mm. I says, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they called to the main station there on, on uh, base on K, and uh, they said, yeah, we need him here. Uh, the sergeant says, okay, when I get a chance, I'll run him in. And that was about, oh, I suppose we were about two and a half mile away from the airstrip to the main station. Yeah. And uh, got over there and they said, well, you're going to work with us now and they will we'll retrain you for structural firefighting and pipeline fires. Pipeline fires? Okay. So I get my bunk and uh, get my mosquito netting and all that, pick my bunk up. Finally, they issue me a M14, a 45, a steel pot and a flak vest. Now I'm feeling, I don't feel good about it because I still don't know whether I could shoot at anybody, right. but at least I've got it now. Right. I don't feel like I'm walking around unprotected. And uh, So describe what you did there. Um, for the first two days, all I did was uh, same stuff I did in the stateside. Actually, we clean hose, rolled it up and unrolled it, <laughs> keep it from dry rot, you know, let it air dry. Uh, clean the fire engine, made sure it was in top running order. Tested all the uh, pumps. Uh, we had two generators because we had to keep power. The only way we'd get water for our truck was through a, a pump, electrical pump. So first first couple of days, and then all of a sudden this bell goes off and all hell breaks loose. I mean, we got people running everywhere. And uh, the sergeant grabs me and says, you hop in the Jeep with me. So we take off and we're, we're flying out off base, go out to uh, Highway 1. Take a left, we're heading to Quinyon, or towards Quinyon. We're setting in, Anke is in, in the mountains on a plateau, okay? Uh, if you go towards the seashore, you drop down to Quinyon. If you go to Pleiku, you're climbing higher into the mountains. And uh, we're heading to Quinyon, and about uh, three or four miles towards Quinyon, we come up on this fire, and you can see it, I mean, mm -hmm. Every time the pump surges, flames shoot out, probably 50, 60 feet. Hot as all get out. You know, it's 110 there anyway without any mm -hmm. heat. And I've watched the truck pull up, and they, the sergeant says, you don't do anything, you just watch this time. And I watched how they attacked it, and how they knocked it down. And then I watched the pipeline crew which is another portion of the engineers, replaced the, the piece of pipe that had been shot full of holes, set a fire. So uh, we get back to the station, fill up, bell goes off again. This time I get to try my hand at it. And uh, you know jungle fatigue is very lightweight, don't offer much protection against the heat. Well, my very first fire I burnt Mm -hmm. All the hair here and all the hair here, and I got so wet that I actually boiled, well, you know. And uh, the next time they says, well, next time put on the gloves. I says, what gloves? <laughs> you know. So I got the, they had some, for, they're no, what we had then were, are no better than what uh, the women use in their kitchens right. nowadays. Right, right. Yeah. Know, hot pad gloves. So, uh, but they taught me how to attack pipeline fires. Now, these pipelines are carrying oil? Uh, uh, they carry, at different times during the month, they carry uh, aviation fuel, mm. diesel fuel, or MOGAS. Okay. And, and they, this is being pumped from where to where? Right. Okay. Actually, the, the ships come into Quinion okay. at the harbor. Right. Start, that's where it starts. They pump it out of the ship, and each, there's pump stations every, well, 
it starts out like every three or four mile, and then when it gets into the mountains, they're every mile because of having to send it on up. They need more power. Uh, but by each pump station, they, they send it all the way to Pleiku or into Cambodia. Mm. Okay. So during this time there, this was your basic job. Uh, any major events stick out during this period, fighting these fires? Well, when I went there, the, we, we had 10 storage tanks. Since this was a staging area for a lot of different operations there in the Central right. Highlands, we, had, we held gasoline and aviation fuel, and we had a helicopter port. Uh, we had 50, 60 helicopters there all the time. So, you know, this was a fairly good size uh, base camp. And when I got there, there were 10 of them. And during my time there, we lost five of them. To rocket attacks? Rocket attacks. Rocket attacks. Um, so I, this was, this was uh, not a safe place to be. Oh, no, 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 no. no. A lot of rocket know. attacks. A lot of rocket attacks. Um, and we could always tell when it's going to happen. I mean, I, I, of course, when I first got there, I was naive, didn't have the slightest idea what was going on. But you learn quick. And one morning, we were watching the locals come in because they worked for the government. And you could see the ones just shuffling along, weren't doing anything, but you got people that were stepping it off. Mm. And you knew exactly what he was doing. He was counting the number of steps from the front gate to this building to that building to that point, you know. And sure enough, within the next day or so, we got hit in that place that. You know, uh, we had a, a refueling station just just about uh, half a mile from our fire station on the same road, and we were about a half mile in from the front gate. And uh, when they started walking them, they'd walk them right down the main road, mortar rounds, rocket attack, right down the main road, then walk them right straight back. And if you made them unhappy, they'd hit your... Uh, your hooch. Stage, yeah, your hooch, your, your staging line for yeah. all your vehicles, you know. Yeah. Uh, fourth Division was there while I was there. The 82nd was there while I was there. The uh, uh, 101st was there for a short period of time. The one with the yellow, yellow. Oh, patch. first cab? First cab was there. Fourth Division. I still haven't figured this one out. It was one of the strangest things. I know it had to be PSYOP trying to use psychology on them. But they got on there and said, you can't hit us. We're in, impregnable. You cannot touch us. Well, that night, along about 2 o'clock in the morning, they hit our motor pool. And I say our motor pool. It was the uh, engineer motor pool for PA&E, which was a... Uh, Civilian outfit worked over there. They didn't. They did not hit a deadline truck when it was being worked on. These are all the only ones they ever hit. The only ones they even messed with was the ones that are operational. Hmm. And uh, we spent all night in a firefight. We had uh, enemy inside. We spent the next day on a search and destroy. And I pulled three or four of those while I was there, and that's probably the most harrowing thing that I had to do. Because you never, the one thing that got to you is you never know who was your enemy. The only person you could hopefully trust is the guy in the same uniform as you. Mm -hmm. And I say hopefully because we had a lot of wackos there too. So, so on the search and destroy, they kind of randomly selected people to, to go out on these? Or? Well, each detachment or e each unit that uh, was not what I, I, I want to say like a strike force, right. they weren't put in on right. in any of the search and destroy. These were all permanent people for the base camp. Mm -hmm. They knew the camp inside out. They'd know what didn't belong and, you know, if somebody was there, it shouldn't have been there. So, uh, you, you know, you spend four or five hours carrying your weapon, cocked and loaded, 
And every time you walk around something, you're hoping you don't have to shoot. So did you fire your weapon? Oh yeah, a number of times while I was there. A number of times, yes. Did you guys ever get ambushed? Uh, while we were out on the road, yes. Uh, what was that like? Scary as hell. It really was. I mean, the guy was shooting at us from, I would venture to say, 350 yards off, and he was shooting a rifle. And the Vietnamese or the uh, Viet Cong that we were dealing with couldn't hit the broadside of a barn door with the rifle. But you give them a mortar round, and I guarantee you they put it in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. So he was peppering the ground all around us, you know, and, and uh, here you are. You got a, a fire hose. You got 150 pounds per square inch pressure coming out of that hose. It takes everything you can do to hold it where you want, and somebody's shooting at you. So you were putting out a fire, fire and you're right, getting ambushed getting while ambushed. you're putting the fire up. And, uh, and this was one of the few times that we didn't have an escort. Uh, From that point forward, we never left base camp without an escort. Right, right. Did you ever go out on any of the helicopters? Did you ride some of the helicopters? Uh, did not. Uh, I rode in a helicopter once or twice, didn't like yeah. it. I saw too many of them uh, crash and knew how long they lasted or didn't last. Right. So I. It was not something I wrote about. I mean, with your background, and there were obviously a lot of helicopters on your base, were there crashes on base that you oh, had yes. to deal with? Well, I didn't deal with them because the, they d divided our uh, detachment up. There were six, well, actually a total of 18 GIs in our detachment. There were six at the airfield, which fixed wing, six at the heliport, mm -hmm. and six at the structural and pipeline. So, uh, yeah, if they got into a real mess, yeah, we'd right. go out, out right. there. But for the most part, I fought uh, structural fires and pipeline fires right. my whole time. A lot of communication with the people back home. Did you write home a lot? Yes, I uh, wrote home every day and usually got a letter every day. From your wife? From my wife, my mother-in-law, my mother. There was a two-week span that I got nothing. And how are you feeling about uh, that? You know, all you hear about is uh, Jody getting this letter and, you know, and Dear John and this right. and that. I find out that I'm in Vietnam, which is probably the most unsanitary place I've ever visited. My wife has hepatitis. Uh, She's laid up and she can't write. And her mom's busy taking care of her. So, you know, taking care of her has taken precedence over writing me a letter. My mom only wrote probably two or three times a month, you yeah. know. So she had all the kids to take care of, and uh, she really didn't know what to say. Right. You know. Do you have movies on base at INK? I can only see, remember seeing one, and I had to go uh, to the officers' club to see it. Okay. Um, PX there on. Yeah, uh, it okay. wasn't. It wasn't really well stocked, except maybe once or twice during the month. It seems like every time we had a convoy coming to restock the the uh, PX, it got ambushed. Hmm. It just seemed to work that way. Did you go on R and R? No, I you did not. I spent 367 days in Vietnam. A conscious choice there, or you just uh, weren't given the opportunity for? I was not given the opportunity. There was no replacement. Really? No, we had two people get injured, so that took our right. strength down. And there were no replacements. So not even an in-country r and No. You were, on, you were at An K the entire time? Well, I did go to, to Quinn Yan uh, once. Okay. But it was, and I went to play coup once, but both times it was on a scavenger hunt for parts for our vehicle. Okay. So what were you thinking during this time? I mean, did you have any indication of what was going back on, back in the U.S.? I mean, by this time, I mean, protests well, are really pretty uh, um, we, widespread. We, we listened to the uh, uh, Army Armed Forces, Armed Forces radio. radio, and we weren't getting a lot of what was going on. We, we read the Stars and Stripes, and, and I didn't get letters from or excerpts from the uh, newspapers from my family or any, right. anybody, even anybody in our detachment, did I get to look at anything where 
we weren't being well received, you know. Right. We, I, I really hadn't uh, gotten anything like that. Uh, and while I'm there, I think I'm doing right. Right. You know. Sure. So, uh, any tensions, conflicts at Ank? Soldiers getting in oh, fights? Oh yeah, yeah. There were there were, uh, and most of it was between uh, the civilians mm. and their nationalities in the service. We had a lot of Filipinos working for PA and E. Right. And there were some Filipino soldiers, and they didn't like each other. I think because our engineers, the civilians, were communists, hmm. uh, card carrying, really, you know, and let everybody know it. <laughs> and that's not a good thing to do when you're on a U.S. military base. Right. But you know, right. uh, but there was all there was that type of uh, conflict. As far as race. Never had a moment's trouble. Uh, of course, I got to admit there was only one colored guy in our detachment out of the six of us. And, but he would not even hang with the other brothers that he called, you know. Right. He says, they got nothing for me. Right. Uh, did about, I hear about it? No, I don't know why I was on the How about drug use? Uh, had one guy, I'll never forget him either. I'm taking a shower, and our shower, uh, we heat the water with uh, a uh, diesel heater, stick it down in the water, set it on fire, heat it up, so we're down in the shower house, and all of a sudden, a round ricochets off the wall. I'm stark naked, and I'm hitting the ground, you know, I'm trying to get clean, but I low crawl all the way back up to the billet probably 25, 30 yards. I get inside because I figure, well, I'm out of, because I have no idea where this round comes from. It just ricocheted off of it. I go down there and and uh, one of the guys is cleaning his 45. And I ask him, did you hear that? He says, yeah. He's sort of laughing. He says, I forgot to make sure it was empty. I went over and grabbed him, and I says, I looked at his eyes, and he was higher than a kite. Right. I had no idea what he was on, but I says, if you ever, if I ever see your eyes that way again, you're going to spend the rest of the time in Long Bend Jail. I mean, it was bad enough, the enemy shooting at me. I didn't right. need my own guy shooting at me. Were you there during Tet? Yes. All? Okay. Yes. Uh, describe Tet. <sighs> well, Quinn Yang got hit. Uh, Quite hard during that time. In fact, they completely flattened the Chinese quarter in Quinyan. Uh, we got hit. Let's see. They overrun the base two days before I got there, and about two months after I got there. Mm. And that's that's really really scary because it's pitch black, and you got to keep your wits about you. You end up shooting your own people. And your own people know that if they if somebody yells halt, they stop dead in their track because they get shot if they don't. But uh, that's about the only only right. two times that we actually had any. any did part of did it. you have any sense of what was going on throughout Vietnam during Tet? I mean, obviously this was very well, widespread. Uh, yeah, because we we'd hear we'd hear uh, stories from uh, our long long-range patrol mm -hmm. groups, they always come to our place to uh, uh, chill out. So you had LERPs on yes. that base. That, yes. That's an interesting group right. of people. Uh, they were they really weird group of people, but the, the, the LERP group that come to us was a major, two captains, and three lieutenants. Mm. No non -coms. Really? None. It's an unusual right. group. It's really an un... Well, the, the major, I know he was high in the intelligence part of it. The two captains, I'm not real sure what they did because they didn't talk much, but they did like to party. Yeah. When they come back, they, they've spent 
three or four weeks behind enemy lines. They come back, they want nobody messing with them, and all they want to do is drink and sleep. Okay, you're getting short. Did you have a short timer's calendar? I had a short timer stick. Ah, and what did you do on your short timer's stick? Carved a notch in it from, Each, from 90 days back. Okay, so you're getting short. What are you thinking? I'm more aware now because I've been told time and time and time, I mean, it's been drilled into me that the shorter you get, the more likely there's one with your name on it. So I'm really more aware. I start drinking fairly heavy because I, I, I never took drugs. I still have never had any drugs, not marijuana, nothing. Strongest thing I ever had was a Vietnamese cigarette and it was strong. Mm -hmm. A couple puffs of it, you didn't need anything more. It didn't make you wacky or nothing, just the nicotine in it was so hard. But I started drinking, I'd drinking uh, about a half a fifth of whiskey mm -hmm. every two days. And with the beer. So I was staying, I was able to function, but I was hiding my fear in the bottle. Right. Basically. So, so it wasn't it wasn't drinking out of boredom. It was drinking no, it because was drinking of the fear. Because of the fear. Right. Yeah. And the the day comes when you leave on K. What are you thinking when the day you're leaving? Well, that's there's a string, a good story there. I get uh, we we've got to catch a transport to Quinion because the can't catch a flight out of Anke. We're gonna go down to Quinyan. Actually, that's where we're gonna get our papers and everything because our headquarters has moved into Quinyan. So we're gonna catch transport down there. We've gotta be up at 5.30. Major that's in charge of the detachment has us in his billet. Opens up a brand new bottle of Cuddy Sark. Says, you will have a drink with me. It's 5.30 in the morning now. <laughs> I don't like scotch anyway, but <laughs> when the major says, you will, uh, then he gives me a $1 U.S. bill. He says, first beer is only when you hit home. And uh, we caught our transport, went to Quinyan, spent another week in Quinyan. And as soon as I got there, they took my weapon, took my steel pot, took my flak vest, gave it to the guy replacing me. And the uh, bell went off. Well, my instinct was, you know, you head for the truck. Sergeant grabs him and says, you can't go. You don't have any weapons. You don't have nothing. He says, he's taking your spot. So, you know, I go back. And had nothing for me to do. I'm waiting on, on my orders, my flight, when I'm supposed to hit okay. Benoit, the whole nine yards. I'm just waiting. And the uh, truck finally comes back, and it's, it's been ambushed. Mm. I took my place, didn't make it. Whoa. Uh, steel pot didn't come back, flak vest didn't come back. The only thing come back was a pair of boots. So he had just been in country yeah, a few days? just a few days. Wow. Was it tough leaving your friends at INK? Uh, the one friend that I really made, we both got out at the same time. Mm, both so got out at the same time. That's right. good. So I really... I remember most of the people that I, I was with there, uh, but I only really had one friend, and right. he was from Rhode Island, his name's St. George. Right. Hmm. Okay, so you fly out of Benoit, you go down to the replacement station, probably at Long Bin, did you initially? We went back into Long Bin, Long yes. Bin to, right. the, to the, the replacement station there, and then take a bus over to Benoit. Right. Now, the plane you got on this time, so what date is it when you're leaving country? Let's see, I'm trying to remember the exact, I think, it, I'm thinking that it's July, either the 27th or 28th. Of 68. Of 69. 69, right. okay. Now, was this a plane bringing in new troops? No. No, another one where you, it was empty and you just right. got on. just got on. Atlanta Fairways was the carrier at that time and they had uh, chartreuse, Passion Pink, Canary Yellow, Bird's Eye Blue, or Bird's Egg Blue, 
and an orange, fluorescent orange. That was the color of the jets yeah. they were picking me. I got on a green one. <laughs> so describe the atmosphere, plane takes off from Benoit. Uh, everybody is really quiet, because a lot of people still, I don't think it's sunk in that we're out. Mm -hmm. But when we crossed, and you could see the, the outline of the land and the ocean, there was such a cheer that was unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. Right. Now, did you know anybody on the plane? No. No. Okay. Stop along the way back to the States. Where did we you stop? We stopped in Guam. Okay. Uh, we were there for refueling. Right. And that's about it. Okay. And then where did you enter the we, States? We went and uh, we stopped in Hawaii too. Okay. Again for refuel and take on food. They fed me six times in 18 hours coming home. And you went to Travis Air Force Base? Uh, right. Okay, so you land in Travis. Now you've got time left in the military. Right. right? You're not getting right. out. I'm not getting out, so, so I'm waiting. They've already got my orders for me there. I'm waiting on a set of greens. I'm in jungle fatigues, jungle boots, soft cap, and I'm freezing. I just left a place less than 24 hours before that was 110 degrees. It's 70 degrees in Travis Air Base, at Travis Air Base. And I'm, all of us were just downright freezing. So we're waiting on, we've been, I'm sure they, <laughs> they sprayed us. I mean, we've taken hot showers, went through uh, some type of spray. I don't know what it was. Right. Anyway, it was to make sure there wasn't nothing crawling on right. us. Uh, I come home with a change of underwear, my shaving gear, and that was it. And what I had on back. So you're over at Oakland. Oakland Air Base, yeah. And you get your free steak dinner. Right. And all the cold milk, <laughs> fresh cold milk that you can handle. <laughs> and, and where were your orders for? My orders were for Be Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, so you got, what, 30-day leave? 30-day leave. And you come home. I come home. What was it like coming back to Crawfordsville? Ah. <sighs> okay, I, I'm flying across, uh, going to LAX, and I, I got to tell you, I walk in, I, you got to remember now, I've seen one American girl and she worked at the PX in the year. That's all I've seen is one American girl. And I walk in and there's this long blonde or brown hair. I mean, down to the shoulders, turned up just fine, got on a long coat, not overly big, you know. I walk around, it's got a beard too. I haven't seen this, you know. This is something new that I haven't. I, I guess I forgot about it before I went after, or it really wasn't the style, whatever. Uh, so I, I just walk on, walk on, you know. And I'm called a baby killer in the airport. You were? Oh, yeah. How'd you feel? At that point in time, they could have called me almost anything because I was going home. Right. Right. Who, who was calling us? Young, young protesters? Protesters, yeah. right. Right, they, and they, they were in every airport, as far as I know, right. everywhere in the United States that were the guys were coming home. Right. Okay. So you arrive in Crawfordsville, you see your wife for the first time in over a year, mm -hmm. uh, have 30 days. Did people, when you arrived back, did they want you to talk about Vietnam? Did you have an opportunity to talk with your father-in-law, your wife, friends? Um, my wife didn't want to hear about it. Okay. Uh, my mother-in-law, she wanted to shove it over right. here someplace, right. and my father-in-law didn't ask me because I think he, he remembers what it was like right. that he, he figured that if he wants to talk, he'll talk. Sure. You know? uh, Did you want to talk? At that time, no. 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 Did you go to an American Legion or a VFW? I, I, I joined the VFW when I got back. and. Uh, I wasn't well received there either. Really? Uh, Why? They seemed to want me, but about six months after I joined, there came a change even in this city. Right. That uh, I was a member of the 
group of soldiers that lost. Mm -hmm. See, we had winners. We had we were two, two one and, Z, and uh, two one one, one. one right two one, one tie one. and a and loss one, and one tie and a loss, and we were ostracized. I mean, they actually stopped talking to yeah. the Vietnam vets, and yeah. so I just okay. When I got home, uh, my wife had, had uh, after she contracted the uh, hepatitis, moved back home with her mother and dad in, in Ladoga. Well, I don't know if you know much about small towns, but at noon, the siren goes off. Well, in Vietnam and on K, the siren meant incoming. We got home from the airport and you, you, you couldn't have had it. I mean, there's a banner up on the front porch saying welcome home and everything else. Siren goes off and I'm under the car. I mean, it just, just pure straight instinct. Yeah. My wife starts crying, my mother-in-law's crying, my father-in-law, he knows, you know, so he just lets it, lets it pass. But my wife, it took me an hour to get her to calm down. Because she was thinking, well, is he going to be like this from now on in, you know? I said, she didn't understand that 30 hours before I'd gone through uh, an air raid or a, a mortar attack. We were sitting in, in Benoit underneath a steel or tin roof waiting for our planes. We got there at 3 o'clock in the morning. Our plane was coming in at 6.30 in the morning. We're sitting there, two, three hundred of us, and a rocket attack mm -hmm. starts. Uh, we're out. Okay. Where did you do your stateside duty? Uh, was at Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, that's right. Fort, what were you doing in Fort Benning? I was on the airfield there. I was actually back doing what I was. Crash and rescue. Crash and rescue. And we had uh, a lot of uh, uh, C-5A uh, jet planes come in from Vietnam mm. with uh, wounded. Mm. Uh, there was a very good burn center there and a lot of people from Vietnam had uh, gotten injured come up there. Uh, that was probably the easiest duty of the whole time. I worked uh, 12 days a month. I worked with all civilians. There was one GI, my friend St. George, and I both really? ended up in really? in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. He worked 24 on, off 24. I worked 24 on, off 24. Every other weekend, you got a three-day Kelly weekend, just like uh, the civilian fire Five. department did. And uh, so I was only working 12 days a month. The only time I met any military people was if they come into the firehouse. Right. And I did get my heels locked a couple of times there. Uh, when you're in a crash and rescue, especially stateside, you don't wear your belt. You don't button your blouse. You don't have your uh, pants uh, blouse. bloused up with, with your boots. In fact, you don't wear boots. You're wearing low quarters with your fatigues, and your low quarters are not tied. You've got to be able to get out and get into your uh, turnout gear as quick as possible. So I'm... Um, I don't, I don't even know what I was doing. I was in the firehouse and in walks this colonel and he sees me and I got to look like the proverbial sad sack. I mean, you know, I haven't had a haircut for probably two weeks and I'm growing my mustache now, you know, and I'm just sort of slovenly looking. And he locks my heels and he wants to know my uh, name, rank, serial number, uh, what detachment I work for, who my commanding officer is, I gave him all the information and I said, sir, now I want you to repeat to me who your commanding officer is, your name, rank, and serial number, because if you go down, don't look for me to come get you. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, uh, he, my, my commander was the, the uh, post fire marshal and he was civilian. And when he turned this guy in, he, he says, you better hope that he forgets who you are, because if you do have a wreck, he'll be the one pulling your butt out. <laughs> so he come back and he apologizes. I guess I just didn't realize that this is what you had to do. 
you know. what, what's your rank at this time? I'm a specialist fourth class. Okay. How many more months did you spend at mm. Fort Benning? I was there for 11 months. And then you got out? Then I got out. Okay, so you get out of the mil military. What, what's the date now? What are we talking about? I got out, uh, let's see, joined June 30th. So it's, 19, it's, a, it's, uh, it's 1970 70. and it's June okay. 29th or something like that. And you come back to Crawfordsville and you go back to work at R.R. Dunn. Uh, right, they didn't want to take me back. They didn't? No, I left, went straight from Donnelly's. I took two weeks. I got married June 11th, found out on the 15th that my number was coming up for that month. I was like fifth in the county to be drafted. Decided I wasn't going to be drafted. I was going to join. The recruiter gave me two weeks to get all the things in order. So I was married the 11th, found out on the 15th, actually joined the service on the 15th, and left on the 30th of June of 1967. All that happened in, the, in that month. Right. right. And then uh, when I got out, it was again on the 29th of June in 1970. Come back to uh, Carversville, went back to Donnelly's. He said, we don't have a home for you. He says, we have no slots. You were an apprentice road tender. We have no road tender openings. I said, I don't care. I got a job. He says, no, we don't have a spot for you. I says, okay. So I left there and I went and called the guy I used to work for, who is now a supervisor at Donnelly's. And uh, I says, they don't want to give my job back. He says, let me make a phone call. He calls personnel and uh, he told me this later. He says, you've got to give him his job back because if you don't, he's one that will take you to court. He went from here to the service. You know our standing. So they gave him a job back. For about nine months, I changed shifts every two weeks. Was in probably 20 different departments. And finally, I got fed up. I went to him and I says, look, I'm only a year or so away from being out of Vietnam. What you're doing to me now, it's a nuisance, but I can do it standing on my head. He says, you want a better employee, I want to be a better employee, put me back where I belong. Went back into the press room, got an apprenticeship, was a uh, journeyman pressman, uh, a journeyman four-collar assistant, and now I'm in uh, production. Uh, uh, children, how many children do you have? I have two boys. Okay, and how old are they? Uh, Chris is 30 and Jeremy is 25. Okay. When you came back to Crawfordsville, and over the years, did you join a Vietnam veterans group? I did after probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. the, when I first come back, when I first come back to the, uh, to Donnelly's, people would ask, have you been away to school? I said, yeah, I've spent three years in the South. <laughs> he says, oh yeah? I, says, I said, yeah, I was in uh, Alabama, South Vietnam, and Georgia. <laughs> and uh, they dropped it right then. Right, so they, they didn't, didn't talk want, to you about no, it? No, they didn't want to talk about it. Again, you got to remember that, that there's been a change in the mindset, even in a town that, you know, your hometown, right. that you thought, well, I know everybody here, you know, uh, but there's been a mindset change that we were the losers, you know. Uh, they started believing the, the press. Um, everything bad that was written, I did it. You know, I was in Vietnam, so I had to be killing babies, and I had to be killing women, and I was mutilating bodies, and, you know, I was a dope addict and, you know, wasn't to be trusted, that kind of thing. Right. The typical stereotype right. of the Vietnam vet. Of uh, the Vietnam vet. Yeah. So, I just, yeah. I buried it. I, yeah. I mean, even my wife, she wouldn't talk to me about it, uh, which is probably a good thing. I had nightmares for quite a while when I first come home. And uh, she just, she wouldn't even mention those the next right. day. So what made you join the Vietnam Veterans Group? Um, mainly because I wanted to talk to somebody. I, I could tell that, that there was something 
that wasn't quite right. I mean, there was stuff I needed to get off and I needed to talk to somebody that had been there and knew what, how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could get it mm -hmm. so uh, sort of smooth things over. Uh, and, and did that group help you? Oh, it, it definitely did. It definitely did. I mean, you could talk to these people and when you said something, they didn't look like, at you like, you're crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. What's the matter with you? They knew what you were going through and they knew when you said something, they knew exactly what you were talking about. I mean, we had our own, we had our own language. Right. Have you been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial? Yes. What, yes, I what have. was your uh, feeling when you first saw it? I cried. Uh, I want to know. I was there in November. It's cold in Washington D.C. in November. I want to know why that stone's hot. I mean, when I felt it, I found the person that took my spot. Oh. And when I felt his name, it wasn't, it was warm, okay? Mm -hmm. It wasn't cold like his bigger granite would be. Like, you know, that's cool. It wasn't that way. It was, it was warm. And that's always struck me as being, there's something alive there. And I took my sons back to it. Uh, let's see, Chris was a senior. And Jeremy was an eighth grader, and I took them to uh, to see the memorial. That that must have been an important moment in your relationship with your sons to be there at that wall with with your two sons. It it really was. It really was. And they've talked to me, and uh, you know they've asked me right. about what happened mm -hmm. then. Uh, how do I feel about it now? Uh, would I do it again? And my answer has been yes. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, why'd you say it so quick? And uh, you, you don't believe in uh, what the war finally has stood for. I said, the only thing I don't believe in is that we killed 50,000 plus people for no reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what bothers me. And we didn't, we didn't stay the course, and that that upset me more so after I got home and actually had a time to sit back and reflect. And I, even talking to the other Vietnam vets, if there's one th is that we didn't stay the course. So, so you feel your country let you down? I do. I really do in this in this in this instance. And yeah. and I, I've talked to my sons about the war in Iraq. Uh, Desert Storm, I was so mad. I was so mad when we stopped. We had him on the run. We wouldn't have had to be doing what we're doing now. We wouldn't have killed 800 of our GIs right now or thousands of the Iraqi people right now had we not stopped during Desert Storm. We just plain stopped. I mean, hopefully we'll learn from our history. They say we always do. Well, I hope they finally stay the course and come out with an honorable way to get out. I'm going to end this way, Mike. How would you, in five or six words, sum up your Vietnam War experience? It's a tough one, but are there some, is there a phrase or a sentence that comes to mind to sort of express your feeling about your Vietnam War experience? I changed from a boy to a man. And that's often what any soldier will say in any war. But that's, I went there as a boy and I come home as a man. I saw stuff there that was, uh, a boy couldn't handle. Right, right. Any final comment? Anything you wanna, you wanna say before we shut off the camera? No, just to let people know that while I was in Vietnam, uh, I celebrated my 21st birthday there, and uh, New Year's Eve, we had a party, and I dressed up, I had a white sheet as a diaper, bandoleras across my chest, bare chested, steel pot, and a rifle, and they took pictures. I've got a picture of that somewhere, but, you know, we did find time right. to relax also. I mean, right. we were all there 
and all scared as all get out and it it helped keep things sort of normal well let's let's end at this point i want to thank mike fry for sharing his experiences with us and and i want to thank him for his service to uh to our country and i just want to say welcome home thank you